Welcome back. Uh, I'm Shannon Lundeen. I am very pleased to be here. I am the director of the Floristone Mather Center for Women here at Case Western Reserve, which is right across the street. And although I am not an attorney, I'm married to one, which I've told people just makes me generally more anxious and not really more knowledgeable <laughs> about the law. <laughs> Thanks for increasing my anxiety today through this conference. As you all know, we are on the third panel of the day, which is uh, called Pretext and Rationale. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. I'll introduce them in the order that they appear in your program, but then we're going to change it up and we're not going to go in that order. So I'm going to keep you guessing. So, we have Caitlin Borgman. She's a professor of law at City University of New York Law School, where she served on the faculty since 2004. Her scholarship is the respective roles of authority of the courts and the legislatures in protecting constitutional rights, role, excuse me, and judicial treatment of fact-finding in constitutional rights. And she's written extensively on reproductive rights. Professor Borgman received her bachelor's degree from Yale University and her law degree from New York University, where she was executive editor of the New York University. She clerked for Judge Robert P. Patterson, Jr. of the Federal District Court for the Southern District of New York and spent four years as a litigator Polk and Wardwell. After that, she was the State Strategies Coordinator at the Reproductive Freedom ACLU for six years. In this capacity, she was responsible for providing ACLU affiliates nationwide with legislative, legal, and communications advice and support. She also litigated reproductive rights cases. She's spoken widely about reproductive rights and has given testimony before several state legislatures on this issue. She's also the editor of the Reproductive Rights Prof blog. So you can find some of her musings there. Uh, next to her is David Brown, who is a staff attorney at the Center for Reproductive Rights. He joined the center in 2011 a fellow and became a staff attorney in 2013. He served as lead counsel in the center's victory of overturning Oklahoma's emergency contraception restrictions and has been a crucial member of litigation teams on several other important on behalf of the center, including overturning Arizona's unconstitutional ban on abortion at 20 He's currently challenging two laws in North Dakota. Center represents the state's last abortion clinic, an outrageous ban on abortion at around the sixth week of pregnancy and an attempt by the government to severely restrict the use of abortion. Before joining the center, he was associated with a law firm of Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton. Brown earned his law degree from the University of Michigan Law School, where he served the editorial board of the Michigan Journal of International Law and published a note entitled Making Room for and Gender Identity and International Human Rights Law, an Introduction to the Yogyakarta Principles. Before law school, David was a grant of the Latin America program of American Jewish World Service and obtained his bachelor's degree from Pomona College. He serves currently as a board member of the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. Next to David, we have Dove Fox, who is the Assistant of Law at University of San Diego School of Law. Professor Fox teaches and writes in areas of and procedure, health law and bioethics, and the regulation of technology. Prior to joining the faculty of USD School of Law in 2013, as a law clerk to the Honorable Stephen Reinhardt of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Fox has also worked at the President's Council on Bioethics, the consulting firm of McKinsey and Company, the law firm of Rosen and Katz, and the civil appellate staff to the US Department of Justice. Professor Fox earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard University in 2004 and was subsequently awarded a scholarship to attend Oxford University, where he earned his doctorate in political theory in 2007 and served as lecturer in politics and philosophy. The Soros Fellowship for New Americans to attend Yale Law School. All three years at Yale, the faculty awarded him the Grutter Prize for Best Paper in Law and the Biosciences. Fox also won the Brody Prize for Best Paper in Constitutional Privacy and the Family Court Review National Writing Contest Grand Prize. He was twice recognized for teaching excellence and served as projects editor for Yale Law Journal. He graduated in 2010. Fox is a reviewer for leading journals of bioethics and law and a regular contributor to the Huffington, Huffington Post. His recent publications, and this is just in the last two years, actually a year and a half, I think, um, yeah. <laughs> include Dualism and Doctrine, an Indiana Law Journal, Interest Creep, Washington Law Review, and Neurovoir Deer in the Architecture of Bias in the Hastings Law Journal. 
please join me in thanking our panelists for joining us today about the ways in which women's health rationale serves as a pretext in numerous attempts to restrict women's access to abortion. I will give you one sneak peek. We are going to start with Dove. <laughs> and then we don't know where we're going to go. Thanks so much, Shannon, and thank you to Jesse Hill and to Diana Horch for inviting me and for having such a phenomenal event, and I'm so very, very happy to be here. We've heard a lot today about different kinds of fetal protection measures that shame, <coughs> stigmatize, and punish women who are pregnant or who have been pregnant, might become pregnant. Um, and we've heard that oftentimes the rationale uh, offered in defense of these measures has to do with the protection of fetuses. In the terms of constitutional law, this is cast as the state's interest in potential life. In the next few minutes, I'd like to take seriously this purported justification and see where that leads us. Now, the state's interest in potential was announced by the Supreme Court in 1970, Roe v. Wade, as a very special kind of state interest, as the very powerful and canonical kind that can override even fundamental individual rights, at least sometimes and in certain circumstances. Yet neither the Supreme Court nor any other court has ever explained just what kinds of concerns are comprised within that interest. What exactly does the state's interest in potential life mean? What is potential life? What exactly is the state talking about when it purports to advance or promote that interest as the rationale for any number of laws or policies uh, affecting uh, pregnant women <laughs> and otherwise? Well, let's consider uh, just one example. Um, of how this indeterminacy obscures judicial reasoning and distorts its outcomes. A few years ago, New York authorities proceedings against a mother uh, who was identified only as Kathy after her child, called Fatima, was born exhibiting symptoms of cocaine withdrawal. A family court found that Fatima's condition at birth called for judicial intervention to place her in the custody of social services to take her away from her mother. The court's rationale for holding that Kathy's parental rights, quote, must yield to the compelling state interest was that it was so important for the state to advance this interest in, quote, potential life. Now, as a reason for why Kathy wasn't any longer allowed to care for her child, this bare invocation of the potential life interest, as if its advance and its application was too obvious to need explaining, really tells her close to nothing. It leaves Kathy and her lawyer or any judges on a or any future litigants or citizens or interested advocates or policymakers only to guess at the reason, at the real reason that Kathy's pregnancy purportedly provides sufficient ground to prohibit her from raising her daughter. And when I say the real reason, I don't mean what was actually going on in the heads of the judges or even necessarily what the legislature said, but rather what that interest in potential life might mean in the way that it applies in this context. Does that interest in potential life capture a concern, for example, that Kathy's conduct harmed the fetus that Fatima was before she was born? That's one interpretation, be a fetal welfare kind of argument. Alternatively, is that interest about a concern for the harm to the child that Fatima is now, or after she was born. That would be a concern not for fetal welfare, but for child welfare. 
Or does it instead reflect a concern for the tendency of prenatal drug use generally to impair the health at the cohort level? Even if, in this particular instance, it didn't leave Fatima herself any worse off. Well, that would be interest not in welfare or in child welfare, but something like the social effect of offspring health more generally. Or is this interest in potential life actually concern about eroding uh, the value of respect for the unborn, um, about imparting a message that unborn isn't as valuable as we ought to think about it, even exposure doesn't harm any embryos or any children or any fetuses at all. That's a fourth kind of a thing that the court might mean when it invokes or uncritically relies on this bare interest in potential life. This would be something not about social effects, but about social values. Now, the authority, and this is just one example among dozens of other totally disparate contexts in which legislators, courts, and others rely on this interest in potential life. And it's not a big why they do so in justifying any range of restrictions. It's because those are the terms that the Supreme Court used. This is the kind of interest that it has said can do the work of justifying these restrictions when they are challenged. But more than mere semantics, distinct kinds of concerns that the interest in potential life might be getting at, respond to altogether distinct public goals and ills. They apply in different contexts, and they have different strengths. And so some can justify greater restrictions than others. For example, the social value that is in promoting a message of respect for the unborn. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that this interest is absolutely legitimate, that it's not invalid, but that it's merely legitimate. That is, it's not compelling. It can't go so far as to justify a policy that restricts individual rights, even if it can justify less restrictive policies. And so invoking potential life in a way that actually refers to social values, but in a way that seeks to justify a rights-restrictive measure, is to co-opt that language in an indeterminate way that really smuggles in a uh, less powerful interest for what sounds like a more powerful one. Now, another reason why this is the Supreme Court said in Roe itself that an embryo or fetus, quote, represents only the potentiality of life, thus disqualifying it from having any individual interests before it is born. It's possible acquisition of such interests, the Roe court said, is contingent upon its live birth. Accordingly, no fully developed fetus has any legally protectable interests, at least in the federal constitution, of its own, apart from this interest in potential life that the state has in it. Interest. This child welfare version of the interest, the interest in promoting the live birth of healthy and this concern for the well-being of the baby that an embryo or fetus after it's delivered alive is much more powerful. It's compelling not only at viability or under certain circumstances, but compelling immediately. This is at least when we're talking about very serious uh, harms or dangers to children is at all times a compelling interest. Well, why are children with federal rights of their own? That the state steps in parents' patria to vindicate their interests on their behalves as especially vulnerable citizens. And it's entitled, therefore, to special government protection. Not so the interest in potential life. Whereas fetal welfare interests represent a concern for protecting the embryo or fetus that has no interest itself, this child welfare interest protects the interest of the child as a much, in a much stronger way from conduct that took place before it was born. 
But this child welfare interest, by contrast to the fetal welfare version, is different not only in time, but in kind. The welfare one is stronger. Accordingly, those who would argue that the fetus has its own legally protected interest in being born, or that in potential life is compelling at all times, or without regard to development or context, simply fail to acknowledge or at least take seriously in court's refusal in Roe and every case since to confer to the unborn itself the kinds of individual interests that children acquire only at birth. Now, if the state's interest is more precisely understood in these more particular kinds of ways as a concern about fetal welfare, well, punishing women like Kathy, who give birth to a drug-exposed baby, doesn't serve that interest because this interest is absent under conditions in which state action, like the action brought against Kathy, is conditional upon live birth. There, it doesn't matter for purposes of fetal welfare what happens to the or fetus after it is destroyed or brought to term like Fatima was. The fetal welfare interest that Roe designated at, as compelling at viability, again, is an interest in protecting an embryo fetus itself. But up until the point, at which it is either born or no longer alive. Thereafter, this fetal welfare interest falls away altogether. This is what I think is the most apt description of the potential life. And thereafter it's born or after it's not there anymore, that falls away. And so the state makes a mistake to claim its uh, mantle in defense of laws that apply under those circumstances. Punishing drug-addicted women, in fact, undermine this fetal welfare interest. And so far as fear of detection and reprisal use during pregnancy encourages drug-dependent women either to forego the clinical care important to preventing miscarriage or even to terminate pregnancies that they might otherwise keep. Now, of course, the state might have other interests at stake in these kinds of questions. Uh, for example, in the harm that's incurred to an individual baby like Fatima or to the generational cohort to which she belongs. Now, these are powerful governmental interests indeed. But the state can't simply card out these interests anytime uh, prenatal action involves an embryo or fetus. You can when you're talking about fetal welfare. Well, is there a fetus? Ah, the interest in potential life. But not so when you're talking about child welfare or more generally or social values. Here you need to establish in more careful ways the relationship between the particular policy in question here, drug sanctions before birth, and some plausible evidence uh, regarding child welfare or offspring cohort health. You need some sound reason, some kind of evidence to think that punishing women who use controlled substances during pregnancy does actually promote offspring health at the individual or cohort level. You can't just assume it, and you can't just uh, hope that it's true. These are empirical claims that want for evidence or at least some sound justification. And yet, as we the most and reliable examinations, uh, the, the broadest studies, uh, a, a, <laughs> the 36, the most methodologically sound peer review studies, about in utero drug exposure, at least in case of crack cocaine, have found no consistent negative association between prenatal cocaine exposure and physical growth, developmental test scores, or receptive or expressive language. This same meta-analysis concluded that, quote, no independent cocaine effects have been shown on standardized parent or teacher reports of child behavior. And even the less optimal motor scores that the study did identify up to age seven months fell away thereafter. And they reflect less exposure to cocaine than exposure to other factors like alcohol and secondhand smoke. To the extent that prenatal drug use does harm offspring health, and therefore, in a way, the, woman, that the state rightly so, a child welfare interest, Punishing women has neither created a strong deterrent effect against such use nor changed social, behavioral, and environmental factors that are associated with it. 
A hospital drag nets that monitor drug use during pregnancy deter patients from, receive, from receiving needed medical care for the mother and the resulting child, too. That's why every major medical uh, public health organization agrees that pregnant women who use controlled substances, when they're faced with the threat of criminal or even civil penalty, are less likely to stop using drugs as a response are to try to keep their addiction hidden from the physicians whose care improves offspring and, of course, maternal outcomes. The blank to potential life in cases like these obscures whether sanctions for drug use during pregnancy serves the interests that those policies purport to. Their conflation under this single potential life also makes it appear as if these more commanding interests support those sanctions when unbundling them in the way that I've tried to do so feels that they do not. Now this uncritical reliance on the potential life interest matters for more than just action that infringes rights. That of course leaves a whole swath of potentially troubling uh, restrictions untouched. It frustrates the ability of court this uncritical reliance does to uncover not just reasons that are too weak to justify restrictive policies, that's the compelling interests that justify rights infringements, but also the illicit reasons that can't justify any policy at all, even very weak restrictions, no matter how lenient the standard of review that would apply. More careful interest analysis, however, can uncover what is in fact the only apparent justification might not be legitimate at all. Consider that fetal and child welfare interests can't credibly explain sanctions against prenatal drug use in states that don't punish either drinking or smoking pregnancy, even though the adverse child health effects of drugs like cocaine are less severe than those of alcohol and comparable to those of tobacco. That last sentence was a quote from your medical journal. Moreover, prosecutions that are pursued under the ostensible authority of the potential life interest target prenatal conduct by women in ways they Target prenatal conduct by men, like spousal abuse and secondhand smoke, that incurs comparable risk of harms to newborns. Finally, prenatal drug policies proportionately afflict low income women of color compared to affluent whites whose often alcohol dependency or prescription or technologically assisted reproduction are altogether exempt from punitive interventions. And what plausibly accounts for this disparate treatment of equivalently risky prenatal conduct across gender, race, and class are two impermissible judgments that get hidden under the cover of potential life. The first is a judgment about what kinds of citizens are worthy of being parents. The Supreme Court held in the early case, 1942, of Skinner v. Oklahoma, that the government may not require the sterilization of certain similarly situated criminals, in this case thr thrice convicted thieves, but not others, like thrice convicted embezzlers. Now that holding might be thought to apply very narrowly, only, say, to sterilization, owing to the particularly exacting physical and procreative burdens that that practice incurs. But a more expansive reading of Skinner might also thought to make that holding prohibit government from restricting the reproductive lives of citizens that it regards as undesirable. Under this broader interpretation, the state may not impose, in ways that go even beyond sterilization, certain kinds of invidious criteria for who is allowed to be a parent. Professor Goodwin is among those who, is, who have persuasively argued that forcing poor black drug-dependent women who continue their pregnancies to forfeit their freedom or their children. The government sanctions against prenatal drug use in this way carry out ethnocentric judgments that certain members of society do not deserve to have children. There is beyond this a second impermissible judgment, and this has to do with enforcing sex stereotypes. The state punishes women alone, or at least more severely than men, for conduct that poses similar risks of harm to the unborn or to children at birth or thereafter. Now, what credibly explains this unevenness is the state's insistence 
upon its own vision of the women's role to care for children. A plurality of the Supreme Court in Hood v. Casey made clear that the 14th Amendment forbids the entrenchment of such gender roles. Accordingly, the government cannot compel the view that the sacrifices of childbearing and child rearing, however ennobling they may be, should be endured by women alone. To punish only women and not men for conduct that causes unhealthy delivery is to charge just the one sex with the cost of protecting unborn life. Such restrictions reflect the illicit common that consigns women to the center of home and family life with attendant special responsibilities that preclude their full and independent status under the Constitution. Disentangling the state's interests that lie behind these indiscriminate appeals to potential life, however, sets us down a path that makes possible for others not only to analyze with greater precision the application and the strength of state concerns in various cases. Evaluating these concerns on their own terms also lets courts smoke out these very kinds of illicit purposes, like prejudice or stereotype, that naked appeals to potential life can conceal. So I'd also like to thank Diana and Jesse and everyone else involved in organizing this um, fantastic symposium. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, so the problem that I'm addressing today, or the issue, is whether the Dormant Commerce Clause might be a useful framework for um, proving the unconstitutionality of trap laws. Are you all super excited? <laughs> <laughs> so if you find the concept of the Dormant Commerce Clause, which as a phrase just sounds boring when you even say it. I'm not totally disturbed by that, although I do fear my presentation may be a lot more boring than the others, but because I think that um, one of the things that, I, um, that I'm aiming to do here is to find a way to get at the pretextual purposes behind trap laws. And I think that asking courts to find that a legislature had an illicit motive um, to obstruct access to abortion is something that they are not always eager to do. And so understanding that this, this kind of analysis is going on in the Dormant Commerce Clause context might um, give some comfort to, to some uh, otherwise open-minded judges to um, look behind these pretextual purposes. Um, all right, so I'm just going to do a very brief review of trap laws and the undue burden standard because I think most are familiar, but um, so targeted regulation of abortion providers um, or trap laws target abortion providers for discriminatory treatment um, and uh, abortion facilities, right? They treat, they, they impose restrictions on abortion providers and facilities that are not imposed on other providers um, and um, facilities of similarly um, or even riskier medical procedures. Um, and they do so under the guise of supposedly protecting women's health. And um, the Andrew Burden Standard, as we know, um, established by the Supreme Court in 1992 in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, says that the um, states can regulate abortion for in um, in the interests in two for two interests: one, the interest in potential life that Dove was talking about, and the other to promote women's health. Um, but they can't do so in a way that would place a substantial obstacle of a woman seeking an abortion. They can't have either the purpose or the effect of So the laws, as I said, is that they discriminate against abortion without a valid medical reason. Um, and what's interesting about trap laws is that they purport to regulate for women's health only. There's no pretense on the part of the state that they are legislating for the purpose of potential life, right? So that's off, they've taken that off the table voluntarily when they um, pass these trap laws. Um, but we know that the women's health rationale is, is pretextual, so the question is how best to um, prove that. Um, so we need a framework that reveals that, and I think that the Dormant, Dormant Commerce Clause jurisprudence is potentially helpful in two, one, um, in looking directly at the purpose behind these laws, and two, in making the state justify its 
law with, um, with attention to the discriminatory means of pursuing the purpose that it says it is pursuing. So um, there are two ways, as, as this reflects, there's two ways to attack the pretextual um, rationale of a trap law. The first is just to attack the purpose directly, and that would mean that the plaintiff would have to prove that the legislature's real purpose was to impose a substantial obstacle on abortion. Um, and some scholars have argued for a, re or a reinvigoration of the purpose prong of the Casey framework, because the framework is an alternative, right? You can either prove that the legislation has an unconstitutional purpose or that it has an unconstitutional effect. Um, and courts do seem increasingly interested in purpose since we've had this wave of um, trap laws that seem so blatantly um, pretextual. The second way to um, attack a, uh, the, the health and safety rationale of a trap law is to do it indirectly. Require the plaintiffs to prove that there's an unconstitutional purpose. You make the state um, justify the law, right? You ask the state to justify um, its supposed health and safety rationale and prove that it's actually um, going to make women safer. And there are some recent trap decisions that take this approach. So um, notably, a, a federal district court in Alabama, um, Judge Thompson, um, also the Seventh Circuit, both evaluating admitting privileges laws, which require abortion providers to have admitting privileges at hospitals that are nearby without any, uh, to, uh, any safety or other reasons to, to right. There are, many, there are many reasons why they might not be able to get those privileges that are unrelated to the safety of abortion or the, uh, the competence of the provider, which means that they're effective, as we've seen in Texas, in shutting clinics down. Um, and then also a Ninth Circuit decision, Planned Parenthood of Arizona versus Humble in the Ninth, uh, sorry, yeah, in the Ninth Circuit in last year, um, invalidated medical abortion regulations doing a same sort of analysis. And these decisions have in common is that they, they compare the extent of the burden that a law imposes on women with um, the strength of the state's justification for the law. So the, the bigger the burden the state is placing on women's access, the greater Justification the court is placing on the state um, to prove that its law is really further. So again, there's so that's in the second mode, right? Making the state justify the law. So again, two two ways: attack purpose directly, or do it indirectly by making the state justify. And I think the dormant commerce clause case law can help with both approaches. So why do I think we need a different approach? Well, just more broadly, as the Ninth Circuit and humble, the analysis in Casey is really seem focused on state laws that purport to advance the state's interest in potential life. Um, when, a when a law um, purports to advance the state's interest in health, which is another recognized interest in Casey, um, the application of the undue burden standard doesn't seem sometimes as appropriate. Um, it's not as obvious how it should apply. And I think the reason, one reason for that is that the health discussion in Casey is sort of comes almost like as an afterthought because the state, uh, the court spends a whole lot of time talking about the state's interest in potential life and how Roe undervalued it and restrictions that blatantly are promoting the interest in potential life necessarily um, regulate abortion as different from other medical procedures because it's, it's the one where there's an embryo or a fetus, right? So it's the one where there is a potential life makes abortion different. Um, and so they are regulating abortion as abortion. What's different about laws that purport to regulate abortion as a medical, and the court in case even used the words, you know, like it, when you regulate, like you would regulate other medical procedures, is that it's obvious why you would single out abortion, particularly as an incredibly safe procedure. Um, and so uh, most of the, the restrictions around it uh, don't make a whole lot of medical sense. Now, why am I not just satisfied with what the, um, the, these recent decisions are doing in terms of this balancing of, um, of burdens? I mean, I think it's great. <laughs> I think it's totally fantastic. But I do think that um, there's, there's a potentially problematic way in which those link the extent of the effects 
or, or link sort of effects and purpose, I should say, right? So they're looking to prove that a law has burdensome effects in order to get the heavier burden of justification. And um, so it, it fails to make the purpose prong a truly distinct prong in the way that I think we'd all like it, or many of us would like it to be, right? And the other um, related problem is the pre-enforcement nature of a lot of these challenges, right? So in order to get a trap law struck down with that theory, you have to be able to show that there's an unconstitutional, um, that there are, there are these very burdensome effects, and if you can't convince the court of that, then um, clinics could close ahead. You know, it could be irrevocably, um, irrevocable in some cases, and we've seen that in Texas. So, um, so it'd be good to be able to challenge um, and ferret out pretextual purposes without necessarily having to um, convince a court, right? And, and we all know, I mean, courts have different, so, you know, burden is sort of in the eye of the beholder, how far is too far to drive, and all of these kinds of things. Um, all right, so now just a quick overview of Dormant Commerce Clause analysis. Dormant Commerce Clause analysis is getting at the question of discriminating against interstate commerce. So um, the uh, Congress has power over interstate commerce. And the question is, can states regulate interstate commerce? And what um, states are not supposed to unduly burden. So there's a similar sort of issue that courts are looking at, right? Is there an undue burden being placed by the state regulation on interstate commerce? Um, and so one, the, the, the first preliminary question that a, state, that a court asks when someone is challenging a, a law as violating um, the Dormant Commerce Clause, so the Dormant Commerce Clause being a limitation on what states can do in interstate commerce because of Congress's commerce power, right? So this is a negative or dormant aspect of the Commerce Clause. So what courts look at is, does the law, first of all, does it discriminate against interstate commerce, right? Because laws could be written in a neutral way, but actually end up having the effect of discriminating against interstate commerce. So there's three ways that a law could discriminate against interstate commerce. One is um, facial. Um, second is that it has a discriminatory purpose. Third is that it has a discriminatory effect. So any one of these three things would make the law discriminatory. And if it were found to be discriminatory, then the court would apply a strict test in dormant commerce clause jurisprudence it, it's called virtually per se invalidity. Um, but the courts don't down once, even though they say it's virtual per se invalidity, they go through this analysis where they put the burden now on the state to justify that the law was motivated by a purpose other than economic protectionism. So basically, states can regulate in a way that impacts interstate commerce as long as their motive is not in, um, economic protectionism. So their motive might be environmental protection or health and safety. Um, but what, so, so usually that's what they say, right? It's about the environment or it's about health and safety. And then the court asks a second question. So assuming you have a reason other than economic protectionism, which is the evil that the Dormant Commerce Clause is meant to prevent, right? We want to have free commerce between the states, among the states. It, um, is there a less discriminatory means to accomplish the same purpose? Um, okay, so that's Dormant Commerce Clause analysis. Now, um, I think there are two ways in which this can um, help in challenging trap laws, and it parallels the two different ways that I said that you can ferret out a pretextual purpose. So one is if you want to directly attack the purpose of a trap law, um, recent Dormant Commerce Clause cases in the Eighth and Fourth Circuits have applied a purpose analysis to ferret out a discriminatory purpose when a law is neutral on its face. So, um, and the test looks a lot like um, the equal protection test for facially neutral laws that discriminate race or other um, protected classifications. Um, so it looks at things, um, statements made uh, leading up to the statute's adoption, including irregularities and procedures used to adopt the law, um, a state's inconsistent, or consistent, sorry, pattern of disparately impacting members of a particular class of persons, the statute's historical background, including any history of discrimination by the state, and the statute's use of highly ineffective means to promote what, what would otherwise be a legitimate interest. Um, and there are courts that have found a discriminatory purpose. So I think it shows that 
um, although there's this kind of common assumption that it's really hard to, to identify legislative purpose, that it is possible um, to do so with this dormant commerce clause analysis. Um, and then I think similarly, because the dormant clause has this, these in, independent purpose and effects tests, so this being solely finding it discriminatory on the basis of purpose, um, it seems similar to the undue burden standard and appropriate um, to look to its analysis. I think there's a similarity in terms of looking for the discriminatory purpose in that um, economic protectionist purposes are more openly expressed by legislators than things like race discrimination. So the case that Alexa was talking about like, is, is unusual because the legislatures, legislators were so open in their racist comments, right? We don't usually see that in like race discrimination because it's not politically um, it's not politically acceptable for them to make those kind of statements usually publicly, but um, <laughs> but um, but economic protection, state, right? I mean, they want to say that they're protecting their state. I mean, you know, Virginia will not become the dumping grounds for New York City's trash, right? I mean, the governor said that openly in a case, and rah rah, you know, <laughs> like the the constituents love that. And similarly with abortion, right? The legislators have been unable to restrain themselves and governors. Um, from saying things like, you know, we want to protect women's health and safety, and this will end abortion in the state of X. And so um, I think there's a similarity in terms of these statements being um, put in the record that um, we could follow by looking at how dormant commerce clause analysis um, identifies those. But the second um, way, and I'll try to be quick with this, is the making the state justify, right? So it's, it's, we're not saying that the plaintiff has to prove um, Thank you. Uh, we're, we're not saying that the state has to prove an unconstitutional purpose directly. I mean, I'm sorry, that the plaintiff has to prove an unconstitutional purpose directly. We're saying the state must justify this law for a reason other than, um, in, in the abortion context, for a reason other than wanting to place a substantial obstacle in the path of women. And this gets at a difference that sort of struck me as I was originally doing the purpose analysis part of this, which is that I, I, what suddenly occurred to me is that in, in, the dor in, the, in the purpose analyses that occur in the Dormant Commerce Clause um, context and the Equal context, courts are doing it to find discrimination in the first place when they have a facially neutral law. Right? They're not yet at the stage where they're saying, but the real reason was economic protectionism, right? They're just looking to see, does the law discriminate against interstate commerce? So. And then I realized, but in, abortion laws are always facially discriminatory, right? I mean, that's the whole problem. Like, trap laws are facially discriminatory. So why are we up here on the purpose trying to find out if they're um, discriminatory? Yes, they're discriminatory, right? So we should be, like in the Commerce Clause analysis, we should be now at the next phase where we're saying the state must justify why it's treating it discriminatorily. And I think this, um, you know, is useful, again, in the trap law context because they're not purporting to regulate for the reason that would obviously let them treat abortion differently, right? There's an embryo or fetus involved and we're concerned for this embryo or fetus or whatever they mean, right? Exactly what they mean by that as Dove points out. But that's, you know, it, it makes it um, not true in the trap law context where they're not even purporting to do it. So, um, so I think that um, what this would do is uh, require that <coughs> Um, that, so again, in the Dormant Commerce Clause context, right, the trigger is a discriminatory law. And the reason for the trigger is that um, we know that states are to discriminate against interstate commerce for economic protectionist reasons. And similarly with abortion, right, I mean, yes, we could regulate certain medical procedures differently. You might say, well, why can't we just regulate abortion differently? Well, because like in the Dormant Commerce Clause context, we have a history of disparate treatment of abortion for a different reason, and that's to impose a substantial right? And so, therefore, that should trigger the requirement of a justification by the state that its reason is other than um, to impose a substantial obstacle. Um, and the, we should require that the state then prove that there's no less discriminatory means. And I think that's a really important component that's formally missing from the recent case law has done in, in validating trap laws. They kind of do it as part of their, you know, looking at the justification for the law. 
explicitly part of the dormant commerce clause analysis. And I think a least discriminatory means would be incredibly useful in the abortion context because we all know that we don't require admitting privileges of other providers, right? We don't require um, other uh, drugs to um, adhere to the original FDA protocol and so on. Um, so I think um, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, th I think that the second, I mean, to me, the second I stumbled upon it was actually a little bit even more intriguing than, than the first one, but I think they are, they are alternate approaches to using the Dormant Commerce Clause context to challenge trap law. Thank you. Um, howdy, y'all. So, uh, my name's uh, David Brown. I'm a litigator with the Center for Rights. Um, thank you all so much for, for having me here today. And Professor Hill, thank you so much, and, and Diana. And, and thank you all for your um, kind attention. So, um, I'm going to expand a little bit on um, some of the points that, that Caitlin made about um, how courts look at uh, whether uh, and how a law that is ostensibly to protect women's health, but actually is passed to ban abortion, move towards a ban on abortion, right? Might be um, upheld or struck down depending on kind of like what the court's project is. Like, are they on board with a woman has a right to choose whether she wants to have an abortion or they may be on board with something else, right? Like patriarchy or whatever it is that they might be. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so what I'm going to uh, go over today is, is um, how using the undue burden uh, standard from, from Casey, which, which people have alluded to and I'm just going to put up behind me, um, can be used either to rigorously scrutinize a law that, um, using vaguely medical sounding terminology, actually shuts down clinics or prevents women from getting abortions, right? Or whether under the same standard, supposedly, they might apply a different test and actually um, affirm literally the same law, right? And so you see across the country, um, a number of speakers have alluded to in the past four or five years, right, literally hundreds of anti-abortion laws have been passed. And the federal circuits have actually reached like totally opposite conclusions on laws, right? Um, and so the result is that, that the constitutional right to abortion is, is literally hanging in the balance, right? Right? And, and depending on what the Supreme Court um, may or may not do in the next abortion case that they take, um, you know, the, the right to choose abortion might either be affirmed or it might be allowed to kind of wither and die on the vine, right? depending on what test the, uh, the Supreme Court decides needs to be applied under the undue burden standard and whether that test requires you know, looking at what a law actually does, actually furthers, the alleged purpose of protecting women's health, right, or whether it actually is a stalking horse to, to end abortion. Um, and, and by end abortion, I'm actually quoting the author of a number of, of these laws, which is Americans United for Life. Um, that's their mission. Um, so uh, Casey's already been discussed. It's been up on the overhead for a few minutes. Um, I'll move along. By the way, this is Robert Casey. Uh, uh, he, he was the governor of Pennsylvania, and I just after his retirement, he kind of like turned into a pro-life brand, right? And this is his autobiography, the story of a, of a courageous pro-life um, whose own brush with death made uh, medical history. I don't know what that was, but he's, um, he's dead now. So um, I don't know, I, I don't know what, the, what the takeaway it's is. It's an interesting race story. I'll put it this way. Oh, yeah? Yes, he got a gang member, a guy who couldn't even get to Got his two organs and skipped the list where there were hundreds of people with oh, wow. organs, and he jumped to the top and got this poor black guy's organs. Couldn't even Oh my gosh! Fascinating. Had to drag him into her own car and take him to the hospital while Casey flew over to the doctor. And wow. Got his organs. Oh my that's gosh! His that's his brush with death. Oh. That's intense. Um, well, so it 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 it, 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 it redefines pro-life. Um, <laughs> So, um, 
And, and I'm not going to talk about the case Gonzalez v. Carhart. I'm just going to put this uh, quotation up because this is kind of the Supreme Court's most recent articulation of the undue burden standard. Basis to act, and it does not impose an undue burden. The state may use its regulatory power. Um, so, so that two sort of two parts, rational basis and undue burden, we're seeing circuit courts around the country kind of grapple with that. Um, and I apologize that, that these slides are all out of order. Um, so I'm just going to do this um, and go back. All right. So um, I'm going to start with the Ninth Circuit that that um, Professor Borg. Right. So, so. Um, we, using our common sense, know that a lot of these abortion regulations that are being passed ostensibly in the name of women's health right, are actually intended to, to cut off access to abortion, ban abortion. Right? And I'll give you the clearest example I can think of is a law in Indiana that says, if you prescribe the abortion, right, which is, I don't, I'm not a physician, but it's a pill, um, you have to do it in a facility which is capable of providing surgery under general anesthesia. Right? And, and again, although I'm not Understanding is that if you take a pill, you have to be awake at the very least, right, in order to swallow it. Um, so uh, this is a law that is aimed specifically at clinics, and I believe in Indiana there's like just one, right, that only offer abortion via a pill method, right? They don't use the vacuum procedure, right? So that law is clearly intended to cause this one clinic to a necessary multi-million dollar renovation, and of course they, they can't afford to because abortion is not a lucrative procedure, right? But that is a law that sounds vaguely medical. Right? Like, of course having an abortion in a surgical facility is safer, right? Um, so although using our common sense, we're like, that's insane, um, as which is very different from using our common sense, <laughs> right? Um, there has to be, there's like this whole sort of scrutiny, right, that has to be applied. And you actually have to figure out, well, you know, could it, could it in theory make abortion safer? And then, you know, if it could, does it actually do so, right? The Ninth Circuit um, has probably what is the most a uh, protective test um, that looks into laws like this, right? And, and um, this, the, the case uh, they applied this test in last year was um, Planned Parenthood v. Humble, which was an error that forbid physicians from using their own medical judgment and experience when abortion pill, right? It said you could only provide the pill using this one narrow state proclaimed method, which physicians know um, is less safe. It's actually less safe, which is like weird. It has more side effects, right? Um, it is uh, less effective, meaning you're less likely to actually have the abortion. And also, fewer women are medically eligible for it, right, um, than under the, the method that most physicians typically use. It, 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 it um, actually prohibits most medication abortions in the state of Arizona. And it will also close, most likely, at least one abortion clinic that also provides only the pill. Um, so, uh, the um, court applied the following test when looking at this law. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the very last sentence. It says, we must ask whether and to what extent the challenge regulation actually advances the state's interest. If a burden significantly exceeds what is necessary to advance that state's interest, it is undue. So what they're doing is something that we would call like a means ends fit. Right? So they're saying, first of all, you know, does this law plausibly advance some kind of interest? Right? And then if it does so, um, you know, is it, is it, does it do so in a significant way or in a minor way? Right? And if it does so in a minor way, then you have to go on and say, okay, um, what are its actual ab abortions? Right? And this test is only, would only happen if you think the right to choose abortion matters. Right? If you're on board with this idea that there is a constitutionally protected right to choose abortion that actually like, is important for women, that, that advances some sort of um, uh, interest that the Constitution is interested in protecting, whether it's women's right to chart their own life course or women's right uh, uh, to have the families um, that, that they desire. Right? If you think abortion is part of that, then you're going to actually scrutinize whether um, a law, even if it may have some actual conceptual relation to health, um, has, let's say, negative effects on the constitutionally protected right that are stronger than um, whatever effects it may have on the actual safety of the abortion procedure. Right? Now, in this specific case, um, the state of Arizona uh, uh, put on no, no, no facts in it. Like, it, it, it it, it didn't put on a case at all, right? It just sort of stood up there uh, and said, 
Um, you know, this law is related, it sounds medical, um, you know, it's related to medicine, like politicians know what they're doing, you know, when they practice medicine, trust them, um, don't trust doctors. Um, and uh, they lost. Well, they've lost for now. So this was a preliminary injunction opinion. Um, once the Ninth Circuit decided this, it remanded the case for trial, and the case has been stayed. And if I have anything to do with it, it'll remain stayed a while. Um, it's my case. Uh, uh, so um, uh, that is sort of on pause, right? But as of now, um, if the state continues to bring no evidence to bear at all, right, it is, it is proper for the state to ultimately lose this lawsuit, right? Because they won't have demonstrated that it actually, as the court asked for, serves a real basis in women's health and that the benefits for women are actually justified given the burdens that women have demonstrated um, it places on women's access to abortion in the state of Arizona. Now, I'm going to contrast this with um, the law in the Fifth Circuit, right? And this is the Texas law that has also already been alluded to. Um, this is a law that has a number of effects, but two of them, the, the two most pernicious, let's say, right, the provision requiring physicians to have admitting privileges at a local hospital and the requirement that abortions only be performed in a freestanding surgical facility that can do general anesthesia and surgery. Um, and uh, again, these, these laws sound sort of vaguely medical, right? It's better if your physician has admitting privileges. It's better to be able to have general anesthesia available, all of these vaguely medical sounding things. In fact, hospitals in Texas are not going to give physicians admitting privileges, right? Because they don't want to touch abortion with a, with a something long. I don't know what you... Cattle what? Cattle a cattle prod. Sure, it's Texas, right? <laughs> um, uh, is anybody from Texas here, by the way? Just, just me? Okay, so so when I so I you know how like you're, if you're part of the group you can criticize it right because it's like from a place of love right so I criticize Texas I'm from there it's not from a place of love necessarily um, but but I will say that um, that uh, hospitals there are like just basically they want to avoid abortion right because it's bad for their bottom line it's it's controversial um, so they they won't give privileges um, there's a few other reasons they won't including that abortion is so safe that physicians will never admit patients to a hospital anyway. Right? And so hospitals don't want to be bothered for, for business reasons having people on staff that, that will never actually do anything in the hospital. So the result is that provision will close most of the abortion in Texas. Similarly, buying an unnecessary multi-million dollar surgical facility will also close abortion clinics in Texas. Put the two provisions together, right, and you're closing 80% of the abortion clinics in Texas. All of the abortion clinics, right, that are more than... Uh, th that are outside of the state's roughly four largest metropolitan areas, right? Um, and uh, <laughs> in this case, the state put on a bit of a case, but, um, and, and this is where it gets interesting, and I'm happy to talk about it more a afterward or, or during Q&A, um, their case kind of fell apart because it came out just at the start of trial that all of their um, expert witnesses who were offering medical evidence in support of the law, right, were, were actually... Um, Lying would be a, would be a good word. Um, they, they was written by somebody else, and they had failed to disclose that. Right. So there's this guy Vincent Rue. He's in Florida. He tried to be an expert 30 years ago. He invented post-abortion syndrome. If any of you guys remember that, um, but the courts didn't buy it, and so he sort of went underground. And now now his like livelihood is sort of writing expert testimony for for other people. Um, so these folks submitted this as their own testimony at the trial. This came out and there were fantastic emails like um, from the, Vincent Rue to the expert witnesses that the state of Texas put on saying things like, um, yeah, you know, I would have used your words, but I was going on vacation time, so I just submitted my own. Um, you know, hope you like them. Um, as a result, the state actually pulled a number of its worst witnesses, right, the ones that were most infected by these problems. And then the rest, um, the court, you know, found after trial, uh, uh, believable, right, because the testimony they were offering wasn't really their own. So although there was some medical evidence there, um, it wasn't too different from Arizona, because most of the evidence in support of this law was withdrawn, right, or found to be not believable by the judge. Um, so what did the Fifth Circuit say? We do not balance the wisdom or effectiveness of a law against the burden it imposes, right? This couldn't be more different from what the Ninth Circuit had to say. Um, so remember that two-part test from Gonzalez, right? If it has a rational basis to and if it does not impose an undue burden. Um, so they said, as to the first part of the law, as a test, 
right? We will never, we will never ask um, whether the law actually um, furthers the asserted interest, right? Once we've determined that it sounds medical, that it's conceivably related to health, right? That um, a, an uninformed person uh, uh, would look at it and think, okay, yeah, this sounds medical to me. Um, we will never ask, again, whether it is actually effective, right, um, in furthering that interest. And they said this, a burden that does not fall on the vast majority of Texas women does not meet the large fraction test, right? And if you remember from Gonzalez that I put it up a little while ago, Gonzalez said that in a facial challenge to an abortion law, um, you have to show that it is unconstitutional in a large fraction of cases. Um, now, the Fifth Circuit said vast majority of Texas women, right? Now, I don't know where they got vast majority from. A large fraction is not necessarily a vast majority, right? Um, but they said it's got to be a vast so I don't know what vast is, 80, 90 percent, um, who knows. Um, so the, but they said, if you're a plaintiff, you have to prove right, that it's unconstitutional when it's applied to a vast majority of the women in the state. Um, and how do you know whether it's unconstitutional? Well, it's an undue burden. How do you know it's an undue burden? Um, well, that slide, I guess. Sorry. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, no, I don't have it. So how do you know it's an undue burden? Um, well, the question is, can a woman still get an abortion in the state of Texas, right? In other words, is there a legally available route, thanks, for her to get an abortion, right? So the question isn't how hard is it, right? The question is, isn't are the restrictions placed on her access to an abortion justified, right? The question is, is there some sort of path for her left to access an abortion in the state of Texas, legally speaking. Um, and I think of it a, a little bit like, uh, uh, was it Kiara was saying earlier, this idea that um, uh, you know, if you're poor, it's because you've made a lot of bad choices in life, right? So the analysis for Texas is, if you make all of the best choices, can you still get an abortion? So if you do everything right, can you still get an abortion? So if there are only seven Texas, and the nearest one is 500 miles from you, right? The question is, is it impossible for you to go 500 miles, right? If you don't have a car, well, is it possible you could borrow one, right? Or ask are you pregnant for one? Um, or, um, you know, get a bus ticket, right? If, um, you know, uh, if you don't have money to get there, could you borrow it from somebody? Could you, um, you know, work and save up for a few weeks? Um, if you, uh, if you, if you uh, don't have a visa that will allow you to cross a border checkpoint, right, because you have a semi-document, um, and well, that's too bad for you. We don't really want to think about you. Um, so there's all of these uh, sort, of, sort of questions that are potentially answerable yes, right? And if you add them all up together and you still get to a potential yes, then it's not an undue burden. So it basically turns... The, did anybody, as like a kid, Super Mario Brothers? Yeah, so you guys remember, like, if you like run and jump and twist and turn, right, and avoid the flying turtles and the, the things that come out of the pipes that eat you, um, then you get to the princess, right? And as long as you can theoretically get to the princess, the right to abortion is protected, right, under the Constitution, according to the Fifth Circuit. So it's kind of the same way. Um, so there's no, there's no question about the difficulty. Right? And this is essentially the, um, the tension um, that we're facing right now as litigators. Right? Like, what do we have to show? Um, and uh, I will add one more, since we're, yeah, since we're running low on time, um, one more uh, quote from your case challenging the same law, right? um, the Abbott case that was also decided by the Fifth Circuit earlier this year. You can see it's a similar um, standard. right? Uh, never roll for evidentiary proceedings. Um, and then this is, the, this is uh, that third bullet point. Um, although some clinics may be required to shut their doors, there is no showing whatsoever that any woman will lack reasonable access to a clinic within Texas. So the question is really, can you show that elusive any woman put before the, the courts um, some woman, right, who even though she makes all of the right choices, can't get to the princess. Um, 
And that's a burden that's like obviously very difficult, right, to, to achieve. Um, so I have about uh, two minutes left. Um, so uh, Professor Borgman you know, mentioned a little bit about the Dormant Commerce Clause, and there's a few other um, interesting areas where the undue burden standard is used. Um, one of them I just want to point out quickly, um, ballot access cases. And I'll mention them because Casey actually pulled the undue burden test from ballot access cases, right? And ballot access is this to vote. You have a right to put the candidate of your preference on the ballot. You have a right to run for office. And in ballot access cases, um, the court applies a balancing test, a means and fit, right? It looks more like the Ninth Circuit than the Fifth. Um, and in this particular case, um, Anderson v. Um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, the court applied this test to um, a law that applied earlier filing deadlines candidates that were not part of a party to get on the ballot, right? And um, the court said it seemed justifiable. And the state made one particular push for saying this preserves what they called political stability, right? They said we don't want to destabilize the two-party system in our state, right? And so ensuring this higher standard for independent candidates, political stability. And the, the, the Supreme Court said, this amounts to a desire to existing political parties from competition, right? Like, obviously. But um, the court went behind what the law did and said, what does it look like you're really doing? We want to preserve right, meaningful democratic access to the ballot. So they applied this, this test. Now, not to end on a pessimistic note, but um, that standard has been kind of ratcheted back in a very similar way to what we see the Fifth Circuit. Why did I just say not to end on a pessimistic note? Pessimistic note um, uh, has been sort of ratcheted back a little bit, right, in the voter ID cases. And um, started to create this, can you show the actual voter who can't get to the ballot standard, which looks a lot like what the Fifth Circuit has done. And in particular, um, the, the um, Seventh Circuit recently and Frank v. Walker, right, took a bunch of evidence that the plaintiffs brought showing individuals were not photo ID um, because they had no uh, birth certificates and they couldn't vote, right? Something that in theory, Crawford v. Marion County said, you, you, you will get you a win in a ballot access case, right? And the court said, well, none of those eight testified that they didn't try really hard to get a birth certificate. Right? Um, in fact, uh, I think like two of them, or, or six of them, didn't say about that at all. Right? And two of them said, well, I tried and failed, but they didn't try. So, um, you know, one, one concern is that um, if the right to abortion is the same way as the ballot access cases, you may not be left with very much. You might only be left with, you have to show like one person who hard he or she tries. Um, can't get the ballot, can't get an abortion, can't get the princess. I'll leave it there. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I think I'm left with some image of, you know, Casey flying from one state to another to get a black woman's son's organs through interstate commerce. Um, yet, really, all they were trying to do was keep her in the home, it sounds like, from Dove's analysis, right? And out of Texas, maybe. <laughs> this was such a very small presentation, and I want to have, I think we have about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm sure that um, you may have some that are directed to the whole panel or some that are directed to specific people. So please go ahead and raise your will come around. Jesse. Thank you again. For the record, I think that um, since this is a conference partly about rhetoric, I think using the word princess instead of abortion clinic, maybe we should start calling abortion clinics princesses and then maybe the politics will shift. <laughs> um, um, but my more serious question, or maybe it's just kind of a comment, but I found um, uh, Kate, Caitlin's uh, talk next to David's talk really interesting and provocative on a number of fronts in terms of how could we sort of reshape the, the doctrine um, uh, on this dormant commerce clause model. And just one other thing that occurred to me, um, David, when you put up the language from the Ninth Circuit where they 
balance sort of what you might call the benefit to the state, right? The benefit of the regulation, how big is it? Again, burden on the woman. That also seems to track another end of dormant commerce clause analysis, which is the Pike test, right? So, and all, I mean, I have to say, I teach com law and I teach dormant commerce clause, but I'm, I'm not teaching it this year and I try not to think about it when I'm not teaching it, so I might be missing. But I mean, it also, the Pike test is also is it defined if there's an undue burden, right? Or no, you so the Pike burden? test, yeah, the reason I didn't talk about the Pike test is it's, the, it's a more lenient test that's applied when this, the law it does not discriminate. Um, okay. Right. Right. It's found right. not non-discriminatory, right. and then yeah, they they balance uh, the burdens. Right. So, so I was kind of trying to. Uh, yeah, it's uh, similar. It's similar, but I was kind of trying, uh, happy to avoid it because in, in dormant commerce clause context, it's much easier to pass. Oh the yeah, pipe. that makes sense. I mean, I guess yeah, I'm I'm sort of thinking, I guess to the extent that there are some facially neutral. I mean, there are you know ASC requirements and so on that are actually facially neutral that might, I mean, it still might benefit at least a little from mm -hmm. having this kind of benefit burden analysis. Yeah, you're right. You, yeah, you could keep, yeah, exactly. And I'll, I'll add one other thing about the, the Pike test, which is interesting, is that um, uh, in a case, uh, United Haulers Association, um, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, in which they said they would overrule the Pike test because it requires balancing. Um, so this gets back to a little bit of sort of saying, you know, what, what, is the, what are your values as a judge? project are you are you with and if you want to give um, the undue burden test teeth you know you can go with some of the cases that Professor Borgman was talking about and, and if you're concerned that teeth in and of themselves are things that justices should not be using you go with Scalia and Thomas in in United Hauling. <laughs> I'm struck by Dove's anal behavior by men um, doesn't tend to be regulated and I guess I wondered if if any of you wanted to speculate on um, how that could possibly be used to kind of shine a light on um, what we're seeing in terms of these fetal protective laws and policies. Um, is there an equal protection claim to be made there? Is this just a policy question? Any, any ideas? Because I really, that was a nice reframing for me. Well, I think at the least it would suggest that, that when men do things that risk harm to the unborn or to born children in ways that states object to when it's women rather than men, that there should be a transparent um, equivalency, that either we should punish men in the same ways, that we should pursue the same kinds of prosecutions, or, as I think will probably be more likely and, and, and better, and you could say, well, if you're not prepared to punish men in those same ways, then do it to women other, uh, uh, either, that to do anything otherwise would be to, uh, would be to treat women differently under the law for no reason, or for no reason that the, that the law can abide. Hi, um, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I have so many questions, um, but I'll try to stick to just one. Um, as you guys are talking, you guys have great points, and I have really so many questions, but I th one of the things that keeps coming up is you guys are, as we're all talking today about rhetoric and language and and ways that I think that the the anti-abortion rights, anti-reproductive rights movement has tried to go about different things. And I'm struck by the last couple of days in Kansas and Oklahoma, these bans on second trimester uh, D and E abortions and this language of the the living unborn child. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how that language moves a court or doesn't move a court um, and how we can, as sort of a pro-reproductive rights community, can kind of sway that, that conversation back to a more medical framing that's not so rhetorically inflammatory. And and take the idea of this fetal protection um, and reframe it back to the protection of the woman, but yet not in a way that goes toward trap laws and things that are not really about protecting the woman. Um, well, I can, I can provide a start to an answer maybe, which is um, uh, to recognize that <laughs> The balancing like of 
the costs and benefits of an abortion to a woman ultimately by her, right? And so um, if she has concerns about her health, concerns about her future, um, it's ultimately her to decide um, which way, when you add those all up together, they cut, right, for or against an abortion for her. And I think um, the whole purpose of laws like the ones that have been passed in Oklahoma and Kansas is to try and encourage people to forget that and instead to think about something else, right? And so I think um, talking, an individual woman and the choice that only she can make and that she has to make center once again, right, is, a, is, a, is at least the beginning of change the conversation and get it back to, to where it used to be and, and getting, getting it back to why we had Roe v. Wade and why we had Casey in the first place. Um, if I could uh, just uh, add on a few more words. Um, Justice Kennedy in uh, the second Carhartt case about the federal partial birth abortion ban, he conflated under the single interest in potential life, um, uh, confusing the responsibility of physicians to preserve life, and blurring the practice of abortion with infanticide, and coarsening society to the meaning or of vulnerable and innocent human life. Uh, this was among a litany of concerns that he says were all just part of this interest in compelling life that Roe had declared compelling, and therefore it was just fine. Uh, for the uh, federal government to ban this abortion procedure. Um, so I think one way to demedicalize or be about what's going on is to try to tease these different interests apart and to see what they are. And that would include, from the perspective of uh, those in favor of reproductive rights, to the other side, um, which is not to say that there is no relevant interest at stake in, for example, banning a particular kind of abortion procedure that many regard gruesome or, uh, or otherwise offensive. It's to say that the particular interest at stake in thus regulating promote um, the value of respect for the unborn is to, um, is to you know, prevent the, what many regard as the callous treatment of fetuses in a way that disrespects that entity. Um, to grant that interest is both, I think, honest and right, and also doesn't lose you the day, at least in so far as that interest is a legitimate but not compelling one. So to say that interest is valid, and yet if, as Justice Ginsburg made clear in the dissent and in the, in the earlier Carhartt case, uh, a restriction on a particular procedure not abortions writ large, if that saves no individual fetus from destruction because a woman just has to forego a safer option for a less safe one, but in any rate, the fetus will, will end up no longer being alive, well, then that doesn't serve fetal welfare. And, and, and to ident articula identify that interest is one that's not at stake. And so you can't appeal to that interest, the kind of the court said is, is compelling, at least after viability, as the one. So I think disaggregating and being clear about what you have to give up or what interests really are at stake, I think, would be a way forward. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think would give the appropriate uh, uh, weight to both sides. I think we have time for two more questions over here and then over here. One of the panelists stated that the state has no interest in um, dealing with pregnant women who use heroin as opposed to they don't do anything when they abuse alcohol or cigarettes or whatever. The reason the state, the state, and any state has an interest in that is because that fetus becomes addicted to heroin. And that treatment cannot be done at the neighborhood hospital or in the doctor's office. It requires special care. And for those of you that are only familiar with Ohio when you've flown over it, it's just a short distance, maybe a few minutes away, to Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, where they have a ward. Infants who are born addicted to heroin go through their treatment. I would like your comments on that. Well, the, the effects of heroin addiction for newborns are serious, but best available studies... You mean a woman has a right to heroin? A child born addicted to heroin? Is that what you're saying? I, 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 I would, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 
you have great concern for um, pregnant women and their, their, the welfare of their fetuses, and I just want to say I think we all share that concern. I mean, it's really a question about how best to protect them. Can you let her finish her answer before you interrupt her? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's a real misconception that, that people think that we're trying to protect the rights of pregnant women. We all share the same thing. I think it's, Im it's important to rely on the best evidence of the harms that different practices uh, wreak and uh, to identify the strengths of those harms as reasons for regulating certain behavior. Uh, as Caitlin suggested, I think we share those concerns and ask only that the best available evidence be brought to bear in assessing them rather than unfounded assumptions. Um, when consequences for women and others are uh, of, of making those assumptions are quite serious. The last question? Do I pass this one? I'm not sure. Uh, so, thank you for a wonderful panel. And I found myself um, listening to you all. I'm um, thinking about how I could better teach this, and specifically um, thinking about investment as a, as a teacher and also my students' investment in the notion of the rule of law. Right? So I think um, so much of what you um, were pointing to shows the way in, in which the jurisprudence right now kind of belies the notion of the rule of law. And it just, I mean, the variability between the interpretation obstacle depending on when you're in the fifth or ninth circuit, the instability of the notion of fetal life, the pretextual nature of the assertion of women's health, the incoherent line between substantial obstacle and a purpose of ending abortions. I think that so much of the, both the scholarly and then also the court's jurisprudence, um, when you go back to Griswold Rowe, uh, the wages of crying wolf, and even Casey itself and the concern with legitimacy is about um, how the court's um, recognition of abortion kind of upsets notions of rule of law by intervening in law and politics. If you as a panel think it's at all worth turning that discourse back against the other side and saying what the courts are now doing is not rule of law, or if that's just, if the issue is so politicized, that's not helpful. Uh, I think one thing that might be useful is to try to situate within other legal contexts. I, I think sometimes um, the uh, curiosities or peculiarities are sui generis or unique to this context by virtue of its history, embeddedness within you know a particular norm. Sometimes yeah, this actually looks altogether familiar and resembles, you know, problems that have been long-standing. So, uh, and with respect to the, you know, indeterminacy of potential life um, that courts and states have been doing for a very long time. You know, when when the bomb us, the uh, you know Supreme Court declares compelling an interest in national security chooses to impose restrictions on people, and then when a state wants to pass a, a mandatory flag salute. Uh, provision, they invoke that same national security because of patriotism. And the court's already said that's a compelling one. Yeah, but this interest looks a little different. Or, you know, we say there's a compelling interest in child protection when a child's getting beaten and you want to remove them from the home. Yeah, seems clear enough. But then in the that's a ban on swear words on television or something. And they, oh, this is about child protection. Well, is that really the, the, the same kind? So I think that oftentimes these things are, uh, you know, we, we find, we, find um, we can locate the, the problems in other areas, and this is just one troubling instantiation of them. But sometimes, and sometimes I think this is something that is really special about the problems that exist at the intersection of sex and uh, gender and reproduction. Later, actually, because I'm not sure I fully understood that. Yeah. I was just going to, to sort of ask you, maybe, are you talking yeah. about for the public or are you talking about for law students? Because um, well, those are two very different. My interest in the question was thinking about how to teach. Because my, my students are interested in understanding as coherent, right? right. And not as purely. <laughs> 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 So much of it, the discussion um, 
against the abortion was that the court got involved in politics. Right. And that's exactly what you were pointing out. In, in um, and I was just wondering for the general public, politically, is it worth recapturing that discussion but on, on the um, abortion rights side as opposed to the other side, or is that just kind of a, a lost battle? So to say that the court should... Well, to, to point out the way in which this jurisprudence is so politicized that it's right. actually compromising this distinction between law and politics in the same mm -hmm. way that um, uh, anti-abortion activists used abortion rights advocates um, mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. all the way back to Griswold mm -hmm. and Rose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just wonder if for the general public, that's a fairly abstract notion, the rule of law, um, the politicization of judging. I mean, I, I think when it comes, so as an abortion litigator, I, I fly a lot and I talk to people on airplanes and they say, what do you do? And I'll say, I don't usually say I'm an abortion but but if I do, um, invariably the first thing out of their mouth is their opinion about abortion. Right, and um, it's just like a, it's a, I think there's something, it's almost like a psychological necessity when confronted with a, uh, a conflict or a, or a, the word's escaping me, but, but um, uh, uh, you know, to, to feel like they're part of a group of people that seems reasonable, right? Um, I'm, and you know, I'm not, I'm not one of the shouters, right? I'm, uh, represent these kinds of values and beliefs in front of a social conflict. And um, I think uh, when you're talking about uh, protecting the abortion right in the courts, I think talking about more fundamental values, sort of like that, right? Like this is how I feel about women, or this is how I feel about choices, I feel about freedom or uh, autonomy. Um, those are probably going to resound more, uh, I'm guessing, yeah. you know, with the public. Yeah. yeah. Definitely agree. I just want to say that as a member of the general public, that <laughs> that one of the things that the three of you together painted a very clear picture of was that um, you know, the, the court system itself, so not the practice of law, but the court system itself, makes me very skeptical of the ways in which you know your, your claims about trying to really get down to the heart of the what is the state's interest in these restrictions, being able to assume that the court could actually reasonably conclude that it's something about some patriarchal notion of keeping women at caring for children, or in the case of applying the test of the least discriminatory means, could they actually figure out what's discriminatory? I mean, in the cases that David was pointing out from the fifth and the ninth, it seems abundantly clear that there really is n not a lot of reason involved in understanding what even, you know, I guess, of as an undue burden, so traveling 500 miles is an undue if you have a friend's car, right? So it just ma it makes somebody, a member of the general public, somewhat hopeless instead of <laughs> the courts. I'm sorry, there's a comment up here. Uh, well, it's along the same lines. In response, it's a great opportunity to open up with students the value of, of doing this project through courts. And it's not obvious that it's been strategy. I mean, we think of the courts as protecting us against the impulses of in Indiana and Arizona, etc. Um, but the other way to counter those impulses is through local politics. And so with that, I don't want to beg the question, but it, I think that it's a great, a great teaching opportunity to raise these questions about the role of the federal courts in these hot issues. Mm -hmm. So Jessie's usually up here wrapping things up, but she's not up here yet, so did you She's coming. Well, she's walking down. make a quick comment. So I feel an obligation to try to help wrap up on a more positive note. Uh, I have no idea Sorry. how I would do that. It's quite the hour and a half. Uh, but, but I want to... And Jess, well, Jessie Hill will, uh, will wrap up. I wanted to say that... Um, it's true that this is all very politicized and the undue burden standard is very politicized. Uh, but having said that, I think I and my colleagues, you know, believe that the Supreme Court and most of the higher courts, all the courts for a moment, most of them, uh, have every intention in um, rationally and thoughtfully looking at this standard. And that we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking 
individual state legislators with various political pressures on them uh, use some of these issues. It's really red herrings to get elected and for all kinds of personal local politics reasons that just because courts um, haven't always been very, um, there aren't, there's not a lot of unity yet in what the undue burden standard means, but that's partially because it's a tough standard. It certainly doesn't mean that the courts, um, I think, when they're interpreting it, are always, quote, being political. Um, I think that it's a really tough standard, and I think the it could be uh, about this possibly coming up to the higher court again is to try to sort of figure out what it means. So I heard the phrase, um, if the KC standard has teeth, teeth, or the undue burden standard. And I would just say back, it does have teeth. It's just being misapplied in a few places. And just to echo that, um, since I did sort of end on a pessimistic note, I, I think um, part of that, because Professor Borgman had done such a good job of, of talking about some opportunities that the undue burden standard might be well used, I think courts feel very strongly that they shouldn't come across as the legitimacy of the judiciary is very important. And um, I think that's one reason why we're actually looking to the likelihood that the Supreme Court will take one or more of these circuit court cases in the next year or two. And, and I know that's a scary prospect for, for a number of reasons, but at the end of the day, you know, we are confident um, that the courts are going to want to um, put some order to the chaos and make sure that um, the process of deciding what the right to abortion should look like going forward um, doesn't depend solely on political considerations and really um, decisions. So we think there's a lot of opportunity um, um, you know, for that to happen and, and um, we're kind of excited about that possibility. Well, please join me in thanking the panel. Well, um, thank you all. I uh, just really brief uh, closing remarks. I did not plan to get up and, and give a full-fledged talk. I certainly would not have put myself at the end of the day if I had <laughs> planned to do that. I just want to say a few words about the sort of uh, theme that uh, we're sort of, we've centered this conference around and um, make a few observations maybe about what we've learned today, some common themes. I'm going to do that a little bit on the fly, obviously, so um, bear with me. Uh, uh, the, so the, the conference, you know, the rhetoric of reproduction is kind of um, maybe very academic sounding or something, but I think that the, the question that has driven us today is really very simple. It's basically how do we talk about these most fundamental experiences of sex, childbirth, um, pregnancy, abortion, contraception, fertility, um, uh, these uh, constellation of issues that we almost all have had some contact with. and. Um, should we talk about them? I mean, it's it, it, it's such a multifaceted issue that really reaches into um, all of our lives, as I just said, and how we, we frame them um, is therefore so very important. I, I teach a seminar every once in a while, rights, and one of my students said to me, as the seminar was wrapping up at the end of the semester, she said, up for this seminar, I thought, I'm signing up for a very narrow course. It's such a narrow topic, reproductive rights. And she said, now that I'm done, I realize it's one of the broadest topics you could possibly um, study. And I think today's um, uh, there's so much ground um, that they, they um, confirm that. So a couple of themes just to throw out there. I, I think there were a number of talks that kind of suggested a criticism, a strong criticism of liberal rights discourse, right, and, and the role it's playing here. So the way that it um, take structural problems like poverty and uh, uh, failings in our healthcare system and turns them into uh, individual problems, medical problems, individual medical problems or criminal problems or individual moral failings. And, uh, and often how those are problems that we try to solve by acting directly on women's bodies, right? So whether it's by incarceration or through um, ART interventions or something like that, it's kind of our first move is to, um, to do that rather than to think more broadly how to deal with, with these questions. Um, and I think that that, um, it, you know, and, and, and how that fits in with the sort of developed jurisprudence we have around abortion rights that still does very much take this individual liberal approach to um, to women's reproductive health and women's equality, um, you know, is a is a difficult question, I guess. Um, 
the other theme that I see here is just sort of the, the power of language how we think about these issues. And um, in particular, you know, there's sort of the power of really privileged voices uh, like legislators in shaping how we talk about these issues. Um, so um, uh, for example, in, in trying to change how courts talk about harm in the sex selection, race selection, abortion cases, or how legislators frame what they're regulating. Um, one, I think briefly just mentioned the Kansas and other states that are now passing these quote unquote dismemberment abortion bans, right? And again, that's sort of the newest rhetorical framework uh, that that or that legislators are are using. Um, but again, also uh, sort of framing abortion around criminal activity, around immoral activity, around um, a shameful activity, and trying to sort of associate. Uh, th that activity with abortion. Um, and, and also just how um, a sex and race selection ban uh, really uh, has the power to suggest something is going on that actually isn't too, right? When it's put in the mouth of these powerful, privileged um, speakers. Um, but also the, the upside of that, that it is possible to reclaim the language both through courts um, that uh, Kara Bridges pointed to the language in Windsor that really didn't need to be there, but does um, uh, shape or um, create, construct a particular narrative about the um, about same-sex marriage, and whether we can use courts to do that, whether there are other ways to kind of reclaim the language of health, um, as our panelists here have talked about, and life. Um, morality, conscience, um, and, and all of these sort of terms that, that swirl around uh, uh, reproduction, as well as the sort of individual narratives in that context, too. So, so those are just, that's just some food for thought. Uh, for 443. So what I all I want to do now is thank people, thank all of our wonderful panelists. I have to say this just really, you know, beyond exceeded my expectations of uh, how this day would go, and, and they were high. I am thrilled um, with all of the presentations. I want to again thank the Center for Reproductive Rights, Diana Horch and Nicole Tuzinski. I have to say I contacted them very early on um, when I knew that I was I was going to be um, helping to plan this conference, and I thought, you know, the Center has this law school initiative. Maybe they'd like to provide some logistical, financial support. Maybe they have some thoughts, and they've turned out to be just true partners all the way. So it really wasn't all me. I have to say that it's it's um, it was a partnership. Um, among the three of us together, um, and it's it's been a really great one, I think. And um, I also want to thank the Health Matrix students who have stayed here all day. This is a really busy time of year for them. They're about to go into exams. You guys have, have been uh, so wonderful and helpful. And um, and finally, yeah. <laughs> and then finally, of course, Nancy Pratt Cantor and uh, Ray Utrep. Uh, Nancy is never here because she's when we're thanking her because she's always busy making sure things run uh, uh, smoothly. But um, this could not have come together without her help either. Thank you all, and I hope we'll continue the conversation. I hope we can continue this conversation, which I think has in many ways just started today. So thank you.